Our focus is on our early learners, children ages two to five, and how you can use food to teach in a way that is sensory based and hits all the different learning modalities. As we've said every week, we encourage anyone who finds themselves in the role of educator right now to engage in some of this non-screen time sensory based learning. So our agenda for today. First, we're going to review all the different ways that kids learn and why it's important to engage early learners in all dif the different learning modalities. Then we'll walk through Jenna's Eat a Rainbow set of lessons, hitting all the learning modalities through fun farm to school activities. And finally, we'll take a look at some other available K through two turnip the volume lessons that you can easily adapt to the early care setting. So real quickly, if you don't already know, I'm Kimberly Kugler, the Farm to School Coordinator at George Organics, and I will let Jenna introduce herself. Hey y'all, I'm Jenna Mobley. I've been an educator for about 10 years. I started as a first grade teacher for many years, and in the past couple of years, I've spent more time in that early care setting and have really enjoyed my time there. So I'm thrilled to get to talk specifically to that community today. So we'd like to start off with getting a sense of who's in the room and all are welcome. The teachers, homeschool teachers, parents, caregivers, pod leaders, tutors, wherever you find yourself in your work with these young children, welcome. And this is really a special age for kids. And so I would love in the chat box today to get started, if you would share what your favorite thing is about teaching young children or about young children in general. So see if you can find that chat box on your screen. I see a couple of folks have already said hi and introduced themselves. And there in the chat box, let us know, what is your favorite thing about these early learners, ages two to five? Oh, I was gonna say something so similar, actually to both Lori and Mary and Carol. Yeah, this is what's so special about this group is everything is new and exciting. It's um, watching those light bulb moments for all of these new experiences that our young kids get to have. Yeah, Paula, you're totally right. They are so eager and they're intrigued and they're curious and they're engaged. It is just such a special age for these sort of sensory explorations where everything is new and everything is exciting. So let's take a look at what Farm to School is, and then we'll talk about how we can use Farm to School as a tool to get some of those light bulb moments to encourage that curiosity and that engagement in our youngest learners. Great. So you may have heard me say this four times already this month, but in case you haven't, Farm to School is basically just getting locally grown foods somehow, cooking and tasting those locally grown foods and learning about locally grown foods and through locally grown foods. So you can get your locally grown foods in different ways by purchasing them from a local farmer or food supplier or by growing them yourself. Consider taking your students on a field trip to the farm to meet the farmer and to see and learn about how that food came to be. We think the best farm to school programs include learning about and through local foods, as I said, eating local foods and engaging with your community around local foods. Hands-on activities like cooking and taste testing and gardening engage students in all the different learning modalities and are fun ways for students to learn education standards that they need to learn, as well as the impact of food choices on their health, their community and the local economy eventually. So the key takeaways are that farm to school is growing and or buying locally grown foods when possible to both feed and teach your students and doing hands-on gardening, cooking and food-based learning. And the reasons that we would choose food as sort of our vehicle for this curiosity and engagement is because there are so many impacts that teaching through food has on young children. 
um, and helps reach all of these different standards that we'll go over in a minute. There are so many standards that as teachers and leaders, we are trying to guide our kids towards and so many of those can happen through food. And of course, we love to see when our kids get more familiar with new foods and then they eat them more and more and they like them more and more. That's really helpful for their development in these early, in these early stages. And the kids love it. It's a lot of fun for them and they're building these life skills. And I think that is the reason enough is that all kids get excited about food and they love being outside. And that's what education, especially in these early years is all about is loving to learn and enjoying the experiences together. So this month, as you know, this is our final week of October Farm to School Month. And this is a month where all of us all across the whole country work together to create resources so that everyone can get involved in this sort of work. So by now, you might have signed up for Turn Up the Volume resources. We'll go over a lot more of these today. I would encourage you before the end of the month to really dig through the resources. There are fact sheets and um, lesson plans and recipes and all sorts of things. Make sure that you save those resources and take a moment to share those with anyone else that you think would be interested. That's what's so great about the resources we created for this month is they are easy to share. They're just one pagers. They're great first steps for not just you, but anyone in your community. So take a moment sometime before the end of the month and make sure that not only you are signed up for these turn up the volume resources, but you can get them into the hands of anyone else that you teach or work with that might be interested. Today, we're gonna to go through even more of these resources for our early learners. But we're gonna start by talking about learning styles um, because this is what's really special about teaching early care. And really all of the best practices for early care are best practices for teaching in general across the ages. But especially in our early care learners, we wanna keep that curiosity, that love of learning, that engagement. And so one of the ways that we can do it is integrating a lot of these different standards that we're always working on teaching. Anything from our math and science to our fine and gross motor skills to our inner and interpersonal sort of skills, all of these standards to connect all of them across of our activities so that our kids can get a good grasp on all of them. We can also look at it in this way and all of these different multiple intelligences and multiple modalities. So when I'm thinking about teaching early care, I'm always thinking about how I can do as many of these as possible and do them quickly to keep all of our learners engaged. So you'll see that today. And this is the language and like the wheel that we'll keep coming back to today is how can we get our kids moving and singing or using language or touching nature and doing something sensory, working with other kids, working by themselves, doing something artistic and visual and just moving all across these different multiple intelligences so that they can interact with the content, with the food, with the garden in a lot of different ways. So let's get started with the lesson set and we will see how all of those play out in this long series of lessons from Turn Up the Volume. Something else that's special about teaching early care and the Turn Up the Volume lessons is that they are built in a sequence, a very intentional step-by-step -step sequence. And this is important again for all learners. This is best practices for all learners, but especially for early care for us to be very intentional about what each little bitty step is on the way to a broader understanding. So you'll see in Turn Up the Volume that each of these lessons can stand alone and be pulled out and put in different orders but they can also be taught in order step-by-step step so that their knowledge builds on each other one part at a time. So as we go through that, uh, as we go through this lesson set, I'll sort of explain why they're in the order that they are and how this leads children into this experience step-by-step. Step. But first, with all kids, but especially early care, it's great to start a lesson with some sort of mindful observation. Now there's a lot more on this in one of our previous webinars about easy outdoor activities for kids, but I did wanna take a second here to share one of the seasonal poems. If you were in that webinar, the easy outdoor activities for kids, you would know that typically we would fold our fingers and we would take a couple deep breaths and we would all look and listen to the world around us just to bring all of our energy together. 
And something else I like to do during that time is to read a seasonal poem. So you could see on the PowerPoint a moment ago, one example of a seasonal poem, and then make sure you can see me now that my screen is off. Like Kimberly mentioned earlier, you can do the speaker view to make sure that my picture is the biggest because I'm going to read aloud a poem from When Green Becomes Tomatoes as a way to bring all of our energy together and set the tone for where we are in time and space before we continue. So the poem I picked today is actually for October 31st because I wanted to choose one that maybe you would do with your kids leading up to Halloween. We know that's coming. And what I want you to listen to is not only the rhythm of the words that are very engaging for kids, but all the critical thinking that can go into a poem like this. What we can draw out of this poem sets so way more than just the words on the page. And that's, those are the questions that we can ask our early learners to see if they can understand a lot deeper than just the one word here of what the poem is trying to say. So this is from When Green Becomes Tomatoes and it's the poem for October 31st. Pumpkin sprout, pumpkin shoot, pumpkin leaf, pumpkin root. Pumpkin vine, pumpkin growing, pumpkin wander, pumpkin going. Pumpkin orange, pumpkin winding, pumpkin ready, pumpkin finding. Pumpkin pick, pumpkin scoop, Pumpkin seeds, pumpkin soup. Pumpkin car, pumpkin light, pumpkin glow, pumpkin night. Pumpkin droop, pumpkin sink, pumpkin mush, pumpkin shrink. Pumpkin toss, pumpkin out, pumpkin sundae, pumpkin sprout. So just in this one poem, I love seeing these smiling faces. Hi, Mariah, thanks for smiling at my cute little poem. <laughs> just in this poem here, we're covering all of the different plant parts and growing up. And then we're talking about how we use the plant here. We're using a lot of those verbs about pumpkin pick and pumpkin scoop and then pumpkin carve. And then it even goes into that decomposition here at the end. And that's just an example of a way that we can get our kids thinking and tuned in to the time of year that we're in, the season that we're in, and already asking questions. Because like we talked about in some of our previous webinars, it's all about asking questions even more than it is finding the right answers. So that's one way that you can start any of your lessons with kids. And then the first one we'll show here from our turn up the lesson, turn up the volume lesson plans is a color scavenger hunt. Now this scavenger hunt sheet you can see here, this is one way to do it. You can also give children paint chips to match and they can do this outside in the garden or in the kitchen or at the grocery store with their parents. But this is an activity where right off the back, the kids are exploring for themselves. They are going out and they are searching and they are looking and they're on their treasure hunt and they are exploring this concept of colors all by themselves with very little guidance from adults. And that is one way that we can really pique their curiosity and their interest is give them that ownership over this activity. And then you can see here on the wheel on the bottom, this of course has kids moving around an outdoor space. So we have that kinesthetic part of our brain working and that naturalistic. And it's very visual because we're matching the colors. So for any of your artistic learners, they'll be drawn to that too. Here's a picture of what this looks like when you do the paint chips. These, really, these individual paint chips are really fun for kids to use. And we use these year round to explore different colors in our kitchen or in our garden to match those colors exactly. And of course, you can use seed packets as well to match those colors. The next lesson here is a read aloud. And this is a read aloud of a book called Edible Colors. And this is a way that we can get kids engaged, engaging that part of their brain of their prior knowledge, what they've experienced before, what they've tasted before, and what they know. So now I'd like for you guys to go to gallery view if you can. That would be the opposite of speaker view where you can see all of us here. 
And we are going to read aloud a little bit from this book. I know it's gonna be very small for you in gallery view, but the most important thing is I'm gonna ask you some questions and we wanna see your thumbs up or thumbs down. So we can see from the whole class, and of course this is demonstrating what this lesson might look like virtually, but we can see from everyone if they've had prior experience with that fruit or vegetable. So the first one says carrots are orange. Show me on your thumbs. Have you had, have you tasted an orange carrot before? Liz has. Great. The next page says they are also purple. Show me on your thumbs. Have you had a purple before? Yes, no, or I'm not sure. A purple carrot. Okay. Now kids, we need the chat box because on the next page, it's going to show us a lot of different fruits and vegetables that can be purple. But I want to know what you can come up with by yourself before I show you. So in the chat box, write down different ideas of fruits and vegetables that could also be purple. Good, Paula was our first one. She said purple cabbage, what else? Purple onion, grapes, good. Okay, kids. Whoa, there's lots of ideas. I'm gonna give you a couple clues. Let's see, we have two purple vegetables that start with the B sound, with a B or the B sound. Oh, and actually three if you count Kimberly's bell peppers. There's two others. Does anyone have a guess? Starts with a B. Ooh, good guess, Martha. And let's see, I have four that start with a K sound. I think we have two of them. We have cauliflower, we have cabbage. There's two others that start with a k sound. Kale, good Liz, and one more. All right, I think you guys get the idea, but let's take a look here. You can switch to speaker view if you'd like to see this a little bit more up close. But this is the next page in this book that shows all of these different vegetables that can be purple. And of course, because we're doing turn up the volume, we would also mention that turnip tops are purple. There's not a picture of it here, but turnip tops can be purple. Good, Carol has lots of them. Great. This is one of my favorite books because it introduces the colors. You can tell I've used it a lot. There's stains all over the front of it because it introduces the colors, but it also promotes this biodiversity and all of these different types. And of course it goes through all of these different colors as well. But that is one way to get started with the kids to activate what they have experienced before, what they've tasted before and what they've seen before. And of course it is a literature connection because you are reading a book and learning that book sense. On our next lesson in the set here, we have poems for each of the different colors that describe the different plants and the different foods and different things in the world that are that color. So I'll show you an example here of one of the poems. If you'll make sure you're on mute, we are going to try an echo read of this poem. That means that as the teacher, I'm going to read the line first in rhythm, and then the kids will repeat that line after me in rhythm. Let's see if we can do it. Purple is a grape. Purple is a grape. Purple is a plum. Purple is a plum. Purple is a turnip top. Purple is a turnip top. And the bruise on my thumb. And the bruise on my thumb. <laughs> Good. I love seeing those lips moving. So this is a way that our early learners are learning language, is that they are repeating sounds and repeating them in rhythm. That's why we love stories for our early ones that rhyme and that have that sort of rhythm, is this is a way that they can gain control of the language, is by mimicking the rhythm and the cadence of speech, of adults reading to them. And of course, these poems are a lot of fun because there's one for each of the different colors in your lesson set. You can see a little preview of them here on your screen. Now with all of those poems of all those different colors, we could go a step further and get our kids moving again and activate that artistic side of their brain again and actually sort of lean into their logical, mathematical side of their brain also by doing either a relay race or a matching game, depending on how you set it up, so that kids can take all of the plant cards, like you can see here, 
and match them to the colors that they see. Now, of course, many plants have many different colors on them. So this can get a little tricky. And what I say for my early kids is that they should match at least one color that they see. Or sometimes I'll say, match the color that's not green. Because of course, all of them have green in them and then there might be another color. But this relay race or matching game is really fun for kids to get up and get moving and sorting these different fruits and vegetables that they may or may not have seen before by all of the colors around those color poems. All right, this is where it really gets fun and where we get into like the content of what we're building up to here. So we've done some explorations around color. We've activated their prior knowledge around color. We read some poems about color. We sorted some things by color. But why does it matter? Here's where we are. This is why it matters. Is that this connects to our health. When we eat a rainbow, it impacts our body and how good we can feel in our body. And so even this, I mean, health is a very tricky concept. Even for adults, it's a tricky concept. How you define health, what it means, what it feels like to be healthy is all pretty tricky. And so for our kids, we've tried to really break it down into what the different body parts are, what those different body parts do, and how those colors impact those body parts. So you'll see in these next couple of slides how we can build up this knowledge incrementally for our kids. This very first one is an Eat the Rainbow song. And I have to be totally honest, this is not in the Turn Up the Volume lesson set online because I just wrote it two nights ago. <laughs> like the night before we had our dress rehearsal, I was like, I really need a song here. Um, so this will be here in the PowerPoint for you. Um, you know, you will get the PDF of this PowerPoint. And of course, we'll have the recording of the webinar on our YouTube page as well. So you can listen back through the melody when you want to too. But this is the song that I came up with that I thought would be fun for the kids um, to practice what their different body parts are. Like the very first step is identifying the body parts. Now, some of this will sound familiar if you've ever heard head, shoulder, knees, and toes. Um, and I added a few more because I wanted to add a few of the body parts that we're gonna talk about when we talk about health and eating the rainbow. So I did add a couple words here and just made it rhyme close enough. All right, so the words are here, but there's also motions. So I think I might, I'm gonna take you off screen share so you can see the motions here and sing along with it. So you'll want to be on speaker view so you can see me to see all of these motions. And I'll show you this little song that I came up with and the motions that go with it. All right, so sort of, the chorus of the song that we'll start and end with goes, eat the colors of the rainbow and you'll be healthy head to toe, head to toe. And we'll come right back to that part. So let's try it together and we'll come back to it. So we're just gonna act like we're eating, like taking a crunch and then showing a rainbow and then head to toe, of course. All right. Eat the colors of the rainbow and you'll be healthy head to toe, head to toe. Good. All right. So then it starts like the song we already know. It's head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. And then I added the next part. So I'll do this really slowly for you. It goes heart, brain, lungs and bones, lungs and bones. Totally made this up and you guys could probably make it better. But this is the one that I did was heart, brain, lungs, and bones, like an elbow, lungs and bones. Yeah, so let's put both of them together. We're gonna start at the head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes, knees, and toes. Heart, brain, lungs, and bones, lungs, and bones. Good, and then we're still gonna do the eyes and ears. Eyes and ears and mouth and nose. Good, then back to our chorus. Eat the colors of the rainbow and you'll be healthy head to toe, head to toe. Can we do it a little faster? You guys feel it? Mariah's ready, I can tell. <laughs> All right, we'll do it top to bottom a little faster. This will be a good test to see if I know the song I just wrote too. All right. Eat the colors of the rainbow and you'll be happy head to toe, head to toe. 
head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes, heart, brains, lungs and bones, lungs and bones, eyes and ears and mouth and nose. Eat the colors of the rainbow and you'll be healthy head to toe, head to toe. <laughs> nice work, guys. You got it. I'm working up a sweat over here. <laughs> All right, so again, those words are here for you in the PowerPoint. And the goal of this is just to get our kids moving, get that kinesthetic part of their brain working and helping them identify what those body parts are first. We're going to know what they're called first and where they are and point to each of them as we sing about them. And then next, it's important that we know what those body parts do. So again, this poem is not in your turn up the volume. <laughs> I mean, yeah, turn up the volume resources because I just wrote it. But the poem is here in the PDF if you would like it. And it's just a quick poem that I wrote for the kids to give them a really quick idea of this next incremental step of what do these body parts do. And for this one, I would have the kids point to the body part when they hear that. You could also do another echo read like we modeled earlier or when they get used to it, a choral read, reading it all together. But for right now, just point to the body parts when you hear. So this poem says, your eyes help you see, your lungs help you breathe. You have bones short and long and your muscles so strong. Your brain is where you think and your heart keeps the beat. Eat the color of the rainbow to be healthy head to toe. So that is our next step. And then after we have all of that, we know where our body parts are, we know what these body parts do, then the kids can color in their human body here that you can see on the left with the different colors for each of the different body parts. So you can see an example there. I'm sure it's obvious that I'm the one that did this example, not any of my preschoolers. <laughs> um, but that'll give them that sort of connection, even if they don't memorize which colors help which part of the body. The idea that we're trying to get the kids to is this broad idea that if they eat lots of different colors of their rainbow, lots of their different parts of their body will be taken care of. That's really the goal of all of these lessons is not memorization, but the big idea of eating a variety. So speaking of eating, the next lesson in here is a cooking and tasting lesson. And one of the things that's most important about this is this naturalistic part of our brain, the sensory part, is actually working with real food, smelling that real food, seeing that real food, touching it, tasting all of that real food. And of course, there we go, we can see our kids. I can have their hands on real food. And of course, our kids can actually be involved in the cooking of this Eat a Rainbow Salad, where we picked all of these different ingredients of all of these different colors. We had a webinar just last week, I believe, <laughs> I think that was last week, for hands-on cooking that goes into much greater detail about this. So definitely check that out if you're interested in how to get kids involved with this cooking. But here's a quick overview is that there are lots of tools that kids can use to help make an eat a rainbow salad. For example, here on the top, you can see all of these different tools kids can use to help you wash all of the vegetables from your leaves for your salad and your salad spinner to some of these veggie brushes or toothbrushes for your root vegetables. A colander works for a lot of your different vegetables and just their hands. This is a great task for kids to feel like they've been involved in making a salad. Then you can go a step further, and in the middle here, you see all of these different cutting tools that kids can use. So of course, they can use just their hands to tear leaves apart. They can also use scissors. If you've already taught that skill, scissors are great for cutting up herbs or green onions, stems like that. And you'll see here, there's a lot of other tools that kids can use that don't have blades, like juicers or garlic presses or mortar and pestles. And then there's also tools that do have blades, but safe blades for kids. And in that last webinar, you'll see how we set that all up so that even our youngest learners can safely use some of these kids' cooking tools. And of course, at the bottom, they can help with measuring and doing the different dressings that's gonna go on your Eat the Rainbow salad. 
So that's that last lesson there in that lesson set. It's all leading up to tasting all of these fruits and vegetables of all of these different colors, maybe in a salad, maybe with a salad dressing that they've made themselves so they can all taste together. Now this lesson is sort of the cumulative lesson of this. And this is so important for so many reasons. And one of the reasons is especially for our young kids, they are trying something brand new. I bet that if you make it eat the rainbow salad, one of those things that you have in your salad is something these kids have not ever tasted before. And they're going to experience a lot of things in their life that they've never done before because they've only been on planet earth for a couple of years. And so building our kids up so that they know how to take healthy and safe risks to experience new things is an important part of our job as educators. These are some of the books that I really like around this idea of trying something new. And I'm gonna read you a little excerpt from how dinosaurs eat their food. I don't know if you guys have seen these dinosaur books. There's so many different ones of them, but our kids absolutely love them. Um, and actually, I'm not going to turn the screen share off for this read aloud because I've changed the words to this book slightly. I'm not sure if you guys are picking up on the pattern here, but <laughs> I am uh, take a lot of creative license to change the words of any songs or poems or books as I see fit to get them just the way that I'd like them for my kids. Um, so I will show you the pictures really small here if you can see them, but really what's important are these words that are on the screen. And if you've read these books before, you know they start with um, something like, how does a dinosaur eat all his food? Does he burp? Does he belch? Make noises quite rude? Does he pick up his cereal, throw down his cup, hoping to make someone else pick it up? And in the beginning of the book, it is always just the terrible dinosaurs doing terrible things. And then about halfway through, it says, no, a dinosaur doesn't do that. Here's what a dinosaur does do. It says, he tries every new thing, at least one small bite. He is brave, adventurous, and always polite. If he likes what he tasted more than before, he raises his hand and asks for some more. Eat up, eat up, little dinosaur. So especially our young kids love to be just like the dinosaurs and how do the dinosaur books. This is a whole series of all sorts of things that dinosaurs do. And this is something that I say with my kids often when we're trying to get up the courage to do something, be just like the dinosaur. He's brave and adventurous and always polite. Those are the things that we wanna hold on to. Now in your classroom, please take the creative license to fill in whatever adjectives there are important to you. I added brave and adventurous because that's what's important in me is that my kids are willing to try even one little taste of something brand new. Now also when we taste, we have our contemplations before eating and we've done these a couple times in the webinar. I think these are so important for us to have some mindfulness before we eat about where our food comes from and who we can give gratitude to. So I'm going to show you how I do this with early care. Of course, with early care, there's always a song or there's some motions to everything because that's such a good way for kids to learn is repeating language, singing songs, and moving their bodies. So I'll show you here what we do for this contemplation. Let's see. Okay, I should be on screen share or the screen share should be off. You should be on speaker view. And for this one, says this food is a gift of the whole universe. And we just simply show the earth, the sky, the rain, and the sun. And that, let me back up a little bit so you guys can see me a little bit better. And those four things is what I want my kids to remember. And having those motions really helps them. So the contemplation says again, this food is a gift of the whole universe. The earth, the sky, the rain, and the sun. Great. And I imagine my kids go home and every time that they eat anything, they're like, hold on, I need to do my contemplation about where this food comes from. I'm not sure that that's true, but I can only hope. <laughs> and then one of our other ones, this is a little rhyme that was inspired by a book called um, Before We Eat by Pat Brisson. And for my little ones, we do some of our sign language around each of these different key words in the phrases. To be clear, 
I am not fluent in sign language, and this is not sign language that represents the entire phrase. I have picked out the one word that is outlined here for our kids to represent the sign for, to give them a way to connect to that language. So on speaker view again, this is what it looks like. It says, as we sit around this table, let's give thanks as we are able to all the farmers is a cross like this, to all the farmers will someday meet that helped and then grow. This is just like that, like as if something's growing, that helped grow this food we eat. Yeah, let's try one more time. As we sit around this table, let's give thanks as we are able to all the farmers will someday meet that helped grow this food we eat. Nice job. That's one of the other ones we do with our kids. And then there's one more. You can read it here before I turn the screen share off. It says, this food gives us the energy to be happy, healthy, loving, and understanding. So for this one, we, we just do the motions for each of those. This food gives us the energy to be happy, healthy, we show our muscles. And then one hand at a time, we put it to our heart loving and understanding. Yeah, this food gives us the energy to be happy, healthy, loving, and understanding. Just little easy ways for kids to connect with some of these bigger concepts. And then of course, after you've tasted, and the kids loved it so much because they were brave and adventurous, just like the dinosaur, and they showed gratitude for all of those farmers that grew all that food, and for that earth and the sun and the water that, great, that made that food grow, and they know that it's nourishing their bodies, and they loved it so much, it was the best experience they've ever had because you're the best teacher in the world. Then, in this last lesson, we want to make sure that we always connect those experiences to home. Now, this is a time when you can connect with your parents and your community about where your local farmers markets are, where your local farmers are, or where any of your grocery stores are that have fresh produce available. To say, we made this great salad today with all these different colors of the rainbow, and here is the shopping list. Your child came up with a shopping list of all the things of all the different colors that they would like to buy to make this salad for you. And here's where you can go get it. Here's the local farmer's market where you can talk to the farmer and you can find these fresh fruits and vegetables of all of these different colors. And giving them that opportunity to not just have that singular experience with you in your classroom, but to extend that experience to their home and create that sort of behavior change and that long lasting impact of feeling like they were able to give something to their community. Now, next I'd like to take a look at some of the other lessons um, in this lesson set that could be adapted to early care. Because there's a couple in that K through two that I use with my early care kids a lot. So I wanted to point those out for you so you could find those. And then just encourage you to take a look through all of the lesson plans that are available because there are tons on there. And so many of them can be adapted in different ways for different age groups. So this one, eating the, eating the alphabet, we actually sort of teased a little bit earlier when we were talking about what else can be purple if it starts with the b sound or the k sound. Well, eating the alphabet is a lesson that I have written for my first graders or for the K through two lesson set. I typically do it with my first graders, but we have a word wall with every letter A through Z and every time we try a new food, we add it to the word wall. It goes really well with this book that you can see here that's referenced in the lesson set that shows all of these different vegetables and all of these different, that start with all of these different letters. And this could be a way that our kids can continue to use language to track all of the different fruits and vegetables that they eat. So every new thing that they eat, if they try a strawberry in the spring, to say, what letter sound does that start with? S strawberries, that is an S. So you can add a strawberry, either the word or probably a picture for your early care under strawberry. And that chart for key, that word wall sort of chart for individuals is also um, a clickable reproducible here in the lesson set. So you can get that as well if you'd like to do more of that sort of um, language learning and letter sounds with the kids. And also you may remember from our very first webinar, 
This up, down, and around lesson is one of my favorites because it gets the kids moving. And this is one of the earliest ways to start to teach about how plants grow. There are so many different ways that plants can grow. And this simplifies this sort of concept before we get into plant parts, before we get into root stems, leaves, flowers, fruits, and seeds, and all that. This is a fun way to say some plants grow up, some plants grow down, and some plants grow around and around. This one is also great because it does have that rhythm, it has that rhyme, and we know that this is one of the ways that early learners connect with language, is through rhythm and rhyme. So let's actually read a little bit of this right now to give you an idea. You can see, oh actually let me turn my screen share off so you can see what this book actually looks like here. There, it's up, down, and around since that cover was not on the slide. And I'll give you a sense of the sort of pattern that's in this book. This is a great one for starting to explore outside in the garden with early care. And every time we say up, the kids can stretch up. Every time we say down, they fold all the way down. And every time we say around, we can twist all the way around. It says, in the dirt, we'll dig a row, drop some seeds and watch them grow. Dirt piles up. Seeds go down, water splashes around and around. Corn grows up, carrots grow down. Cucumbers climb around and around. Peppers grow up, potatoes grow down. Pumpkins vine around and around. And we'll do one more because we're going to see something just like turnips. Broccoli grows up, beets grow down and green beans wind around and around. And this would be a great time to stop and say these beets grow down. They're a root vegetable, just like our carrots that grow down. Where did they go? And just like our turnips, our featured vegetable of the month. So before we even know the terminology, roots, stems, leaves, flowers, fruits, and seeds, this is a way for our kids to get to know that some plants grow up and some grow down and some grow all around. All right, those are a couple of my favorite lessons that you'll see in that lesson set that can be adapted for early care. And I also wanted to mention, point you back to our webinar that we did on the second week on October 7th, that was about gardening with kids. And what's important about this is that it's not just about how to keep your garden alive. And it's not about growing as much as you possibly can. What this webinar is about is about how to make gardening, access gardening accessible to children and how to let them participate in every single step along the way. And to be totally honest, that means that you're not gonna grow as much as you possibly could. Your lines aren't going to be straight. Some of your seeds are never going to come out of the huge hole that the kids put them in. And that's okay. Gardening with young children is all about giving them the opportunity to get their hands in the soil and to use tools that work for them so they can have a part in growing something. It is often messy. It's often inefficient. Um, if you guys remember my example from that webinar, um, part of it is using these yogurt cups inside of each other for every single kid to have a little cup of water to walk over to the garden and pour it on their plants. Now this is not efficient at all. Like I would never in my home garden use a Dixie cup or like a yogurt cup and get one cup at a time and go pour it in my garden, go back and, stuff, get, and pour it in my garden over and over. I would never do that. But for kids, this is a meaningful way that is developmentally appropriate for their fine and gross motor skills for them to have a part in it. And if you're in an in-person setting right now with your kids and you have 28 of them and you want them all to have a job to do in the garden, Giving one kid a hose is a problem for many reasons, but for one reason, if you give one kid a hose, you have 27 kids that aren't participating. And so this webinar really goes through how can we break down these tasks so that all 28 kids have a tool that they can use to have a meaningful part in growing the garden. So check out that webinar for more of those details from planting to caring to the garden to harvesting and what that looks like to do that with our youngest learners. And there are just a couple more resources I wanted to point out, a couple of other places I wanted to point you because there's really too much to tell you, too much to show you in just an hour. But we have created a lot of resources just for early care. One place to check is on YouTube. Georgia Organics has 
their own channel on YouTube if you search for Georgia Organics. And then you can see in the image I have here, if you click where it says playlists, you will see playlists of videos. And you see the very first one here is all of our webinars from October Farm to School Month. That's where you can see all these webinars I've been talking about throughout this one. If you want to replay any of them or share them with anyone, that's where you find those. And then over here to the right, I want to make sure you see this Farm to Early Care and Education playlist. We created a vast resource all around how to garden and cook and, and taste with kids. And we created a whole toolkit. I'll tell you how to get to that in just a moment. A print toolkit that has to be like 100 pages long. But we also created videos that go along with all of these. And our intention were that these videos would be really quick and visual. You can watch us working with real children to get the idea. We call them like our nap time videos that you could like watch during nap time. Um, these like quick ways for you to get an idea of what this looks like with real children in a video. So make sure you check those out there too on the right side. And you'll see a lot of these things we're talking about, about what this looks like with real kids. And then the different guides and toolkits that I mentioned to you, you can find on the Georgia Organics website. So if you go to the Georgia Organics website and then go to Farm to School, there is yet another area specifically for Farm to Early Care and Education. In a straight scroll through there, you will find so many guides and resources, different things that will help you, but that you can also share with your parents, your administrators, whoever you need to gain support from. They're all available right there. All right, so we're getting here close to the end and I would like to open the chat box here again. And I'd love to hear in the chat box um, what experiences you've had with kids, young kids in the garden or cooking or tasting that have worked really, really well. That's one thing I'm really interested in with all of these great people in the webinar right now. That's something I wanna learn from you is like, what is the one thing that is foolproof that every single year when you have your pre-K kids, you always, um, plant a lima bean in a Ziploc bag. You always, I don't know, whatever the thing is. What is that thing that always works really well for you with the young kids? And I also would love to crowdsource here in the chat box too. Are there any questions that you have left? There's something that you would really like to try with your kids and you're not sure how it would work or if it would work with your group of kids or within your setting. I know a lot of us are facing a lot of new expectations and boundaries and restrictions around our work right now. And if that is something else that we can help you figure out, that is something else we can talk about. I just wanna make sure we create the space to answer each other's questions um, about what works really well and how we can make this work in all the unique settings that we're in. Oh, I love what Antoinette said here, planting zinnias and let them pick them to take them home to mom. That's so sweet. Zinnias are so beautiful and they grow, there's tons of zinnias and they're hardy and there's so much fun for the kids to watch grow. And I love anything that you can grow so that the kids can take them home and share them with the community. Herbs are very much the same way. So if you grow rosemary, the kids can get out there with their scissors and practice their scissor skills and just always cut off those snips of rosemary to share with anyone. I love that. And just that sense of ownership for kids too. They're so proud of bringing home that zinnia, that like pride in their eyes is just the best. Oh, and Lori mentioned starting and planting sweet potato slips. That is so much fun, especially after you've taught kids for so long that like every plant comes from a seed and you're like, actually, check out this magic trick. This plant can magically regrow itself. And the other neat thing about sweet potatoes is that's something that once that slip, that little piece of sweet potato in a glass of water in a window starts to sprout, when you plant that in the ground, it's around May or so, it'll grow all summer. And when the kids come back in the fall, if they go away for the summer, they can dig them out. And when we do sweet potatoes, our kids get like all the way up to their like shoulders in the soil going on this treasure hunt, trying to find these sweet potatoes that have been there all summer. That is like one day of the year that all the parents know to bring a change of clothes for their kids because we're just going, we're going all the way in to get all those sweet potatoes. 
Oh, and I love that Sandra mentioned to set up stations. That is definitely a best practice for working with small children or any children is break them into small groups and rotate them through stations. So you're only working with a few at a time. I love that. And you can do art and building and dress up and observation. That's a good way to use all those multiple modalities and have them changing around quite a bit. Ooh, cooking green beans. Oh, and taking the green beans to the chef. I'm so glad Sharon mentioned that too. There's something so special about the kids being able to bring that zinnia or bring those green beans. They just get so proud of themselves. Oh, and having peppermint. Yeah, any of those herbs for them to taste and experience. That herb gardens really are great for those young kids because it's something they can constantly touch and feel and taste and smell all the time. Let's see, and Liz says, she keeps a large plastic container with a closed lid filled with water near the garden beds and 20 to 25 small watering cans hooked onto the fence. Ooh, smart. That is something else. Like all these early care learn teachers know, like we need to know what materials we need and how we can put them away because otherwise it'll just be a mess. But having those cans hooked to the fence, such a good idea. Oh, and Liz, I love that. So that all the other teachers can go out and water anytime. That is such a big part of what we're trying to do here with Turn Up the Volume Resources is not only empower you to do this work with kids, but how do you create an environment where all the other teachers in the school feel like they are comfortable trying out some of these new lessons or going out to the garden and doing some sort of simple task? I love the way that you've set up that environment so that the teachers can go out there anytime and the kids at any age can go and water the, water the plants. Who and growing daffodils. I've never done that before. I love that, Liz. Oh, and Antoinette, I'm so glad you said garlic. Now is the time to plant garlic. We um, talked about that a little bit in our um, planting guide with Kyla. Planting a bowl that you can harvest, it's great. Oh, and yeah, definitely letting the kids dip new veggies in ranch dressing. That always helps. Dips and dressings always help. And it's really fun for the kids to be able to do some of their measuring or shaking things up in a jar, especially with some of those shelf stable ingredients. So that's just another way to get every single kid to have a meaningful task and have that sort of ownership when it's time to taste. Great, y'all. I'm so glad that you shared all of these ideas. Oh, yeah. Shout out to Small Bites Adventure Club. Raw sweet potatoes dipped in honey mustard. Yeah. Did you know you could eat raw sweet potatoes? That was definitely a game changer for me, too, because every year we were planting sweet potatoes in May. We couldn't wait to harvest them. And, you know, when they came back to school in like August or September, and then we're like, well, now what do we do with them if we didn't have our induction burner? You can eat raw sweet potatoes. Yeah, thanks Small Bites Adventure Club for that. Um, Small Bites Adventure Club has a taste test box that they send to teachers. So if you need some help putting together these materials, putting together these ingredients, take a look at Small Bites Adventure Club because they will just send it straight to your school with everything you need and all the instructions and they make it really easy um, for anyone to get involved in taste tests. Thanks, Kimberly Kugler. Yeah, okay, I'm so glad that we shared so many of these ideas from the crowd, I want to go ahead and launch a poll and hear from the folks in this room after digging through a lot of these different lesson plans, what they can look like, all of these songs and dances and whatever to get the kids excited. And a lot of these ideas we shared in the chat. How comfortable and confident do you feel teaching your young learners either in a garden or with cooking or with a taste test? Like from strongly agree, you can absolutely do it or you're not quite sure, you might need a little bit more practice with this. I know, I mean, just teaching early care is one of the hardest jobs in the entire world. And then the first time anyone came to me and they're like, okay, so I want you to take these kids outside, you're gonna dig in the dirt and then they're gonna taste carrots and you're gonna cut them. I was like, what? No, actually Aaron Cram, who does Small Bites Club is like the first one that told me about this. I was like, no, you must be crazy. Like, you don't know what it's like teaching preschoolers. I'm not doing this. Um, I know it's I know it's hard work, so I want to acknowledge that I appreciate all of y'all trying something brand new and something hard for the sake of our kids having these experiences, um, these sensory engaging experiences that they'll remember forever, you know, that they'll take home to their parents. 
I think that's so special. All right, let's see it here. We're gonna have Kimberly Kugler tell us a couple more ways that you can engage with Georgia Organics over the coming months. I'm kind of sad about being at the end of our weekly Wednesday webinars. It's been so much fun to hang out with you guys every Wednesday and share some ideas and see your faces and hear from you guys. It's been really fun for me. So I hope we can keep it up and keep this sort of connection even in this weird virtual world we're all living in. And Kimberly will give us a couple of ideas of how we can keep that rolling. Yes, thank you so much, Jenna. So though this is the last day of our weekly Turn Up the Volume webinar series, it's not farewell, but rather see you later because we actually do have some great webinars in the works coming up in November, December, and January with, with Jenna, um, which I will tell you about in a second. Um, but in the meantime, please stay in touch with us. Remember to take pictures of your Turn Up the Volume activities. And if you post them to social media, use the hashtag Turn Up the Volume so that we can find them. And if you haven't already, you can subscribe to our electronic farm to school newsletter, the eBite. We send it out every month and in it we highlight new resources or innovative resources, funding opportunities, upcoming events, and inspiring stories. And you can subscribe to the eBite by visiting the farm to school page of the Georgia Organics website and scrolling to the bottom. And I will go ahead and put that in the chat. Now, we're also go. at the moment going to talk about some of these upcoming webinars um, that mm -hmm. we have. And I just want to encourage you all. Um, I am just here.